All right, it's the Genesee County Compassion Club show. Hey, thanks for joining me this week. Coming to you live on Ustream.tv and from the FlintTalkRadio.com studios here in Flint. I got John in the studio with me. What's up, John? Not much. How you doing? Good, man. I tell you what, it's a beautiful day. If you guys haven't been outside yet, go outside, get some warmth, get some sunshine, and watch out for the lakes. Yeah, it's like it's 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 slushy in the street. Well, we got the G3C waterfall going on right now. Yeah, it's like uh, yeah. melting in the driveway in the in the parking lot. Melting of the roof, basically. If you go over there, a little overhang is it's like a constant, not even a drip. It's a steady stream. <laughs> 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 but uh, watch your step. All right. Um, hey, I got some medical marijuana news for you this week. Going to share with you what's going on in the world of medical marijuana and uh, a few other things. Man, it's good to be here. Uh, it's good to be outside and not be freezing. I think that's the biggest thing. I know we got uh, something exciting going on. I talked to the bowling team down at the club. It's pretty awesome. The Lebowskis. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, the big Lebowski. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I know they got the urban. Um, uh, urban. I can't think of the last part of it. That's the actual actual team name. Urban something. Urban something, yeah. Yeah, it's totally space. People are going to run, try to do a search on the search engine for those, and urban something. Right? Yeah, I'm sure they're going to destroy it down there at the uh, Grand Blank Bowling League. But, uh, hey, good luck to the bowling team. That's sweet. I like the uniforms. It's pretty snazzy. Um, yeah, I do have some other news for you. We've got the soup kitchen coming up here for the Compassion Club. That's going to be on March 7th. That's the first Friday in March. I'm serving down at the North End Soup Kitchen. Uh, we start serving at 2 p.m., so if you could join us, we'd definitely appreciate it. And uh, we'd be done at about 5, usually is when we finish up the line. But, uh, man, I love the soup kitchen. Come on down. <laughs> That's all I can say. I'm hungry right is now, that, as you can tell. Is that soup that you have there, or the actual, actual picture of an actual soup you prepared? It's right there. No, yeah. actually, we prepare our own food a lot of times when we go down there. Yep. So that's that's like the candid soup kitchen photo. Well, didn't you make a lasagna or something like that, oh, or dude, pizza? We made all kinds of stuff. Yeah, we got we got the master chef Matt who who cooks it up big time. We had lasagna, meatloaf, pizza. I mean, you name it. You know, that's not all that far from my house, really. So I could probably trot down there sometime. You try down. <laughs> if, if you serve, in. you get to eat. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So, and we've always had the homemade peach cobbler. I mean, dude, that right there is alone. That 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 alone is worth it, right there. It's got like three pounds of butter in it. <laughs> it's extra healthy. <laughs> <laughs> you got the defibrillator powders right there in the you nitro tablets, right? Yep, yeah. the roto rooter for your heart valves, all that good stuff. Just hook you right up. Um, but now, come on down. That's March seventh. Love to have you guys help out. And like I said, you do get to eat, so that's bonus, bonus. Um, Check that out next month if you can. Uh, let's see. Other stuff we got coming up here. I know we're all getting excited about the 420 party. Obviously, it's going to be on 419. <laughs> Catch there. Yeah, it's like uh, your parkers are optional. Hopefully not optional. We don't. Hopefully you don't have to have parkas on, you know. And yeah, no doubt. Or waiters, for that matter. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to be partying, uh, celebrating 420 on 419. We're so excited about it. We just couldn't wait for the actual date to come around. Uh, but we'll be doing that on uh, April 19th. That's a Saturday. So tell your friends and family about that. It's going to be a fun event. We're looking at getting food catered, having speakers and all that good stuff. So it's a blast as always. Also, I know that DJ Short's coming up to the club at the beginning of April. So uh, if you're excited about that, check out our Facebook page. Patrick's been working hard on it, Genesee Compassion. Get us as a friend on there. We'll keep up to date with all the news and information and the events that we have going on. But uh, it's going to be lots of fun. DJ These, Shorts are awesome. You still have the webpage, uh, Genesee33.com. We do still have the webpage. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I got that up on the screen, so I just wonder if you still had it going. Or... We do still have it. Okay. Yeah, we're working on updating that. Um, but, yeah, check it out if you can. Get online there. Look us up. It's got all our news and info on there. and keep you up to date with what's up in the club. And, uh, like I said, DJ Shorts coming down. He's an awesome, renowned cannabis breeder. Usually he's bringing some seeds with him. And uh, always brings some interesting stories to tell. And he's one of those guys that you just want to sit down and pick his brain. You know, like, what have you been working on? What's what's exciting right now, DJ, to you? Because that's what's probably going to be exciting in the cannabis industry like 10 years from now. So uh, it's, it's always good good times to, uh, to find out what's up in DJ's world. So check him out if you can. He'll be at the Genesee County Compassion Club. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, other things we've been working on, I know that the club's been avidly searching for 
uh, possible testing, looking to perform our own testing at the club. That's in the near future. Um, this would be, we're looking at having potentially full on gas chromatograph technology there available to so be able to do complete analysis of your medication, make sure it's uh, not having any contaminants or anything like that inside of it, but then also trying to figure out exactly, you know, what is in that medicine, how much is there, what, uh, what combinations do you have of the cannabinoids in your medicine. And I know that this is a big topic for a lot of our uh, caregivers out there. So they try to customize their strains that they have available for their patients. Uh, and also, you know, do a little bit of competitiveness there. See who's got the best or the highest this or that. It's always interesting to know. And, you know, this kind of information is vital for us to be able to figure out, you know, how to be the best uh, providers for our patients to make sure that the medicine is going to be effective and safe. And then also, you know, try to do a little bit of anecdotal research. You know, hey, what, what type of strain is working for this patient? And, you know, hey, what, what's actually inside of it that's making that all happen? It's pretty... Now, what I think is great, too, is a lot of critics of the medical marijuana movement, uh, when I've talked to them, you know, on a personal level, they'll say, what kind of policing is going on? I mean, they could be putting um, miracle Grow on this stuff, you know, and uh, that's what their people are going to be getting instead of the, you know, beneficial parts. They're just going to get these chemicals coming through the fertilizers and, you know, or the pest, you know, the herbicides that they're using. And I said, you know, that's re they've already addressed that. I said they have independent testing that people will really submit to this on their own, their product. And I said, this... You know that kind of uh, that kind of uh, objection really can't be made, especially with your organization, the Jesse yeah. County Compassion. You know, it's interesting if you go into most of your indoor gardening centers, especially here in Genesee County, you're going to find that the majority of those only contain products that are food safe in origin. Anyways, um, you know it's not like when you go to the hardware store or when you go to one of these major uh, home improvement centers and you've got a plethora of chemicals available to choose from. You'll find that the majority of the the products that are sold at your indoor garden centers, like I said, here in Michigan or in Genesee County, are specifically for growing food safe products. You know, products that are meant to be eaten or in some cases smoked. I mean, in this case here, I mean, the indoor gardening centers sell products for all types of gardening needs, not just for patients and caregivers, but essentially, you know, what they're specializing in are food safe products. And so you're not really gonna find a lot of those harsh chemicals that you may find at other agricultural centers. You know, when you go down to the greenhouse, like say, for instance, Wojo's, they're going to sell some products there. And, and not that they're bad, but they're meant for products that aren't going to be consumed. You know, these are, you know, floral arrangements or maybe some type of shrub or tree out in the yard that has, you know, no edible purpose to it. Uh, and there may be certain things there like pesticides or other types of growth boosters and so on, hormones that typically would not be used in an agricultural sense as far as for food product. Um, but when you go to the, like I said, indoor gardening centers, you're not normally gonna find products there that are gonna cause a lot of alarm like that. You know, when people talk about chemicals and stuff like this, I often kind of laugh because to me, it sort of shows a, a misunderstanding of what we're actually dealing with here. If you look at the majority of the nutrients that are out there available to be used to you know, increase your plant's growth, those nutrients are made up of simple, simple minerals. I mean, these are the regular minerals that are found uh, in, in the earth, and, and they're not the harmful man-made type of chemicals that uh, people are kind of referring to. So it's, it sort of shows a lack of information there, and I think that that's one of those misnomers out there that's in the, in the, uh, the myth world, you know, and you hear a lot of people express concern about that. You know, what if someone's using, you know, harmful chemicals on my plants? Well, what do you think they're using? I mean, it's not like you're going out and buying a bottle of DDT and just spraying it on the, on the plant. Uh, you know, certainly it could be, you know, bad things out there. And, and as I stated, if you go to some of these other places that specialize in all types of different horticulture, it's very easy to pick up a product that, you know, may be used to sort of, you know, prevent any kind of bug from being able to uh, hurt the plant or maybe it's meant to destroy viruses or, or some type of uh, other spore or whatever that may be out there. And like I said, those products do exist. But if you're looking at products that are meant for food consumption, uh, you're not going to see that type of stuff on the shelf. So, I mean, in the majority of the caregivers I know, they do their garden shopping, if you will, at these indoor gardening centers. So, you know, companies like Botanicare, uh, Hydro World, um, Hydrodynamics International, you know, uh, other ones out there like General Hydroponics. Yeah, it, it, you may think of those as being chemicals, but really all those are is mineral solutions that are, uh, you know, completely safe. So... Uh, at any rate, I think that a lot of those fears need to be put to rest. 
Of course, the best way to do that is, is by testing, and then you can simply prove that, you know, here in this product, those things are not present or not used. Um, you know, speaking of testing, there's a, a company that's out there right now that's trying to make testing more available to your everyday person, trying to make it uh, easier to use. This is a company out of California, and I'm getting this information from leafscience.com. You can check it out for yourself if you like. It's uh, a company called CDX. And uh, what they're doing is they're producing this product, it's a very similar size to like a cell phone or an iPad. But uh, what it does is it's a handheld device device that's uh, it's called the Mydex or uh, MYDX. I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce that. Anyways, it utilizes certain technology to analyze samples of basically anything you want. The, uh, the technology there that they're using is called electronic nose technology. And this is something that's used uh, in a lot of different types of testing uh, atmospheres. But um, what this does is it takes a sample uh, with the electronic nose of the terpenes and so forth that are emitted, the proteins that come out of that, uh, and then it's able to compare that to a database and uh, create an analysis to find out you know, exactly what may be potent or present there. So uh, interesting device. This is uh, something that may be out on the market here by the end of the year. They're still working on it. Um, it is expensive to produce is what we're being told, but uh, we'll have to see what the final price is going to be. There's no prices yet set, and it uh, looks like they're still looking for some funding for the device. But at any rate... Do you know what kind of accuracy they would have with this kind of testing? Or? You know, that's a good question, John. That's one of the questions I had myself was uh, what type of accuracy could we see with this type of testing method? This is not full, you know, gas chromatology or anything like that. Um, it, it's probably similarly comparable to the infrared type of technology where it's taking a scan of the material and then analyzing that to a database. I mean, you could probably come up with a fairly accurate analysis. Is it going to be exactly what's there? Is it going to be guaranteed? I don't know. I mean, those are questions that I have and it's something that has yet to be answered. Well, of course, the blood, if you do look at a blood example, uh, you know, samples, they could vary, you know, the accuracy could vary from lab to lab. So it's not something to be like, you know, to, to excuse or to dismiss, dismiss using these kind of things. They're actually a good indicator, a good rule of thumb perhaps to use, you know. Yeah, and I think that likely, you know, you may not be getting this exact uh, measurement. And like you said, there's a lot of times even when you're using complicated, more advanced testing equipment, you'll still have variables there that will produce different results from the same product. So that's something else to be considered. There's a margin of error there, if you will, when it comes to testing things, no matter what your testing device is. Now with this here, probably the margin of error is a little bit greater. I mean, we're not having, like I said, a full full on test. Um, you know, it's not breaking the material down and then synthesizing or anything like that. However, uh, it looks like it probably give you a decent margin at least to let you know what range you're in and also potentially detect any pathogens that may be present. I mean, you know, there's certain things that are uh, detectable with this electronic nose technology that, uh, you know, could potentially be bad for you and that this does have the ability to pick up. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, I was reading about this electronic nose technology, and, you know, in layman's terms, you think, well, if that means if you can smell it, then you're going to be able to figure out what it is. I mean, if you look up the actual use of this technology, it's a little bit more advanced than that. It's breaking down these scents into protein synthesis and then analyzing it from there. So it's a little bit more complicated than just taking a whiff and being able to detect what is there. But uh, is it going to be full-on testing? No. I mean, it's just a, it's a variant of that. So I don't know. I, I think this is something good. I, it's definitely... Testing is one of those things that more and more people are looking to have. And if it's not just for their own health purposes, it's, it's for curiosity. People want to know what it is. And I think sometimes that's, you know, like for caregivers, it may have to be like bragging rights, you know, like well, who has the best. And, uh, you know, as far as the industry goes, one of the things that we're dealing with a lot is that we have, you know, similarly named strains across the board. And patients are finding that those uh, results, you know, the, the things, the effects that they're getting off from that medication will vary greatly. And that's because of the fact that these strains, even if they are the same strain, uh, and oftentimes they're not, but even if they are the same strain, they'll greatly vary in their actual cannabinoid content. So, you know, that's going to have a play out in the, uh, in the effects of what takes place onto the patient. And with a testing material, you can start to narrow things down and maybe find out that, well, this 
particular strain of blueberry really works for me, but this other one here doesn't. And, and here's why. Do you think that you see like maybe like the compassion clubs or some other kind of organizations across the states, maybe creating like guilds basically where they have a set criteria, what was, you know, what parameters that, you know, the medicine would have to be to be labeled with that kind of label or you receive kind of some kind of special rating. Do you see that happening or, uh, you know, I don't necessarily see that happening because so many times those types of, uh, scenarios are driven by the seller and not by the consumer so you know the seller wants to create a certain guild so they can say well we put this label on here so ours is superior and then everybody wants to conform to that particular brand or label and in this case here this is a consumer driven uh, type of scenario where you have the the consumers actually wanting to see what are the results is there a certain standard that's been established across the industry no Again, because there's not a single distributor or a group of distributors out there setting those standards. However, some of the standards in this are kind of self-explanatory, and that's one of the beautiful things about cannabis. And uh, you can compare it to edible products at the store. I mean, if you go in and you're buying tomatoes off the shelf, there's a certain uh, level of acceptability of that food product. You know, number one is is it in season? You know, is it was it picked correctly? Was it too ripe or not ripe enough? I mean, these are things that consumers can easily identify just by looking at the product or by, you know, feeling it or so forth. Um, Other things that may be present like mold or rot are are the same in the cannabis industry. I mean, if you have a a product that has mold on it or that maybe has begun to go bad in some way, shape, or form, maybe it's too dry. I mean, these are easily detectable just by hands-on or eye contact, something that most people can do all by themselves without needing anybody to help them out or tell them any different. You know, hey, I, I smelt this particular uh, bud and it doesn't smell good. Okay, well, you know, common sense would tell you don't utilize it. So a lot of these things here, even though it's, you know, sort of epitomized as the, you know, the echelon, to have it all be tested, to have it all be certified, if you will, I think we take for granted the fact that you can apply common sense here and, and look at an edible product and say, okay, yeah, this is fit for consumption and this is not simply by your own personal analysis. Well, you use analogy too, like, a, you know, medical marijuana is a medicine, you know, uses a medicine. Pharmaceutical companies, uh, the generic makers of generic drugs, you know, like, uh, say, for example, Dilatin. I found this out. My dad was an epileptic. Uh, a lot of the off, the off brand or the generic actually didn't have the levels of our um, phenobarbital. In it, it was like a kind of a you know a compound drug dilatin was, and uh, so it didn't have the so full effects. Yet that was rather you know they still pass that off as dilatin or you know really parallel to that, mm-hmm. and that affected you probably great more greatly than say medical marijuana would. You know that would be more crucial to actually have when you have like a, a name brand pharmaceutical uh, drug in comparison to that. I mean that'd be more crucial to have the the measurements because the potential for harm or you know, getting the essential ingredients with the pharmaceutical thing, grade stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, is more crucial. And, uh, you know, the delivery method there is essential. You're talking about pills, something that, you know, you cannot detect what is inside of a pill by looking at it. You're not going to be able to smell it. Uh, there's just no way for the consumer to be able to, you know, analyze for themselves what's present there. And as you stated, you know, in a lot of times, even in the same type of medication that's a prescription drug, can greatly variant the uh, dosing that's in that capsule or inside of that tablet that's being consumed by the patient. I mean, these things are are not something that your average citizen is going to be able to do. They don't have the ability to do it. There's no possible way other than by trusting the certification through the pharmacist or the, the company that produced it. That's why, that's why I think critics of medical marijuana are like kind of missing the boat or maybe throwing up a red flag, you know, a red herring, because basically they're saying, oh, this is so crucial, you got to have this kind of purity or this kind of level. When they accept basically the drugs they're taking for their, you know, their ailments and stuff like that, other than the FDA stamp of approval, which could then after they only measure a certain amount of lots and then they allow it to be produced. You know, you could be getting a wide variation of the and the drugs you take every day for your blood pressure, for a diuretic, or whatever, you know? Absolutely. You know, one of the biggest things I think that has to be considered when you're talking about this dosing and so forth is the fact that cannabis doesn't have a lethal dose rating. I mean, there's, there's no amount of cannabis that you can take that's going to kill you. Whereas in other types of medications, oftentimes there is a lethal dose rating. So well, the same with the phenobarbital, you might have some individuals who might have a tolerance of it to a certain level. Beyond that level, they might find some real, real critical problems. So if there's a too wide a variation in that compounding drug, then that person might suffer some ser- 
might experience death because of it. Absolutely. And it's not the case for marijuana. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things. I mean, though, I think probably the worst case scenario for a patient is they're looking for relief. They utilize some type of medical marijuana uh, substance, and they find that it wasn't effective. Um, you know, r- rarely is it going to exasperate the issues that they're dealing with as far as with their ailments. Uh, it certainly isn't going to cause death like we talked about. But, you know, they might be going back and looking for a different type of cannabis. Or they might just decide that it doesn't work for them. I think that's one of the other things that can oftentimes happen with someone who isn't familiar with medical marijuana. Um, and, you know, the other thing is testing doesn't always, in, in this particular instance, doesn't always equate to being effective. You know, someone may say, well, I think I'm going to really need this level of THC or I'm going to need this many CBD or percentage Um and I think if they were able to have consistently tested medication, look at the results that were posted on that sample, and, and then they correlate that back to their consumption, they may find that, well, you know, just because this one is always 16% THC and 2% CBD, uh, this strain here does not work as effectively as this strain does, which has the same results. And I think that's something that uh, has already been proven, but I think it's going to become more widely known as testing becomes more available. And we've found, science has shown us, that the other types of compounds that are present in the whole plant substance have a lot to do with that. Some of the times the terpenes that are present there will have uh, a different effect when combined with the medication. So, you know, for example, you can't tell uh, one test result from another as far as whether or not it's indica or sativa. uh, indica isn't necessarily going to have a higher THC content than a sativa or maybe a lower CBD or so on. These things here, we still don't know why it does what it does. And, uh, you know, maybe with more testing, we'll be able to figure that out in the future. But, uh, you know, when we're only considerably, you know, consistently testing for two or three different types of cannabinoids, when there's over 60 different types of cannabinoids commonly found, you know, I think we have a lot more yet to figure out exactly how this works or how it can work. Well, look at the DNA in individuals. You know, human beings, they, they know the certain portion of it, this section of it is, a res- this sequence is response for this, this, or this. And then there's also this other area they call the junk DNA. And they're dismissive of that, but it might be in that junk DNA where uh, such thing, her- you know, hereditary things like talent or ability to do certain things might be, you know, resting, you know, in, you know, included in. So it's where there's a plant DNA too. I mean, you know, and the chemical composition of these individual plants. Absolutely. So it's in, you're right, John. It's not always the plant that's going to be making the difference. A lot of times it's going to be the combination of how does the plant work with that particular patient. So everybody's body is going to make a difference, and we have to figure out what's going to work for them. So I think the testing is probably one of those things that as we continue to develop it and it becomes more and more common, you know, we're going to be able to eventually figure out why know particular strains work in particular instances with particular types of patients but until then um we're just gonna have to have people continue to find that out for themselves uh, like one time i went to a dentist i had two shots of novocaine and numb up the tooth and it's still i still had no numbing effect and basically they said just surmise there was some kind of chemical in my blood level at that time that was sufficient enough to basically eliminate the effects they wanted and i just had they just had me go home and come back another day and the same two shots they gave me with the same kind of level of dose they gave me before numbed up the two sufficiently hmm. and it could vary day to day on that kind of stuff so you never know right you never know so yeah any rate um my decks or i'm not sure I, again how you pronounce it mydx check it out if you can but it uh, looks like some form of portable handheld testing may be available in the future uh it's pretty exciting all right i got some other info here for you this is a, a new finding suggesting that a chemical in marijuana can prevent some people from going blind. This is uh, retinus, retinitis pigmentosus. Pigmentosus. Man. It's, it's a genetic eye disease that leads to severe loss and blindness. It affects 1 in 4,000 people and worsens as the cells in the retina, called photoreceptors, die off. Uh, a study published this month in the Experimental Eye Research shows chemicals in marijuana known as cannabinoids <laughs> may be able to slow this down. Uh, a synthetic form of THC was used at the researchers of the University of Alicante Conte? Alicante, in Spain, and they were able to prevent 
vision loss in rats with the disorder. So they're probably using Marinol, the synthetic form of THC. But at any rate, uh, they found that this was potentially useful in delaying the retinal degeneration in the uh, patients. I love how they call the rats patients. That's funny. But uh, anyways, at the end of 90 days, the rats that received their treatment performed better on vision tests and had 40% more photoreceptors than untreated rats. THC also seemed to protect a number of other eye structures, including inner layers of the retina. So that's pretty exciting. Um, it says here that uh, you know the results were encouraging, though not much of a surprise. This is a team notes cannabinoids have been shown promise in treating a variety of degenerative orders, ranging from Parkinson's and Alzheimer's to to uh, excuse me diabetes and stroke. And uh, you know we've also known just like here on our law, we have glaucoma approved as a qualifying condition for medical marijuana, and it has been shown to delay the onset of uh, the symptoms associated with glaucoma. So this is kind of kind of cool, interesting stuff. Uh, it says here, for example, a study in 1978 found marijuana caused a delay in pupil adjustment, concluding that it seems likely that marijuana or a metabolic product of marijuana acts directly on the retina to produce the delay in glare recovery. Uh, so kind of cool. They look like further researchers further research wants to be carried out on this. So yeah. Hmm. You know, actually, I think there's a, the panel is converging, I believe, today. I have to check on this for you. Uh, but uh, for adding PTSD as a symptom to our conditions list here in Michigan, uh, and they're still debating this over there. I, I don't know if they have the, com panel com the panel completely formed yet. They're still working on trying to get uh, part of the state board all together. But at any rate, this is ongoing. One of the conditions that was... The reason I'm bringing this up is because we had uh, a while ago, there was a bill proposed in the Senate to remove glaucoma as a qualifying condition from the bill. And uh, the senator that proposed this was uh, apparently doing his own research and just, you know, through the grapevine heard that, that that's nonsense. Marijuana doesn't do anything for patients with glaucoma. But there seems to be an overwhelming amount of uh, research and studies done that would... Uh, be contrary to the senator's belief. Yeah, because I remember in the 70s when the first idea of, I've ever heard about medical marijuana, you know, being used for medicinal purposes was for the condition of glaucoma. And yes. that was already pretty much established medical fact. And now it seems so bizarre that now somebody's trying to put that in a question. Well, this is about a year ago, and I, the bill never went anywhere, thankfully, so we didn't have it removed. But I thought it was kind of interesting that this uh, person just kind of went out of their way to attack that particular symptom and... and, and uh, and create their own sort of synopsis on truth or fiction. But uh, especially when there's so much, so many different resources out there that point to this being effective treatment for folks with glaucoma. Um, and I, I don't even know as far as uh, you know that being a qualifying condition on the list, how many folks in Michigan that are patients are, are registered patients because of the, that particular condition. I don't think there's a whole lot of them. But, uh, well, it's, just, it's, like they, it's basically they want to do a death by a thousand cuts, and they want to keep on eliminating the possibility for allowing of it, you know, for a certain condition after a condition, and basically you find yourself standing with nothing, no conditions being permitted, and that's what they, these, some of these anti-people want. So uh, I think you're right, John. Um, and on that note, there was a uh, Senate bill that was fast-tracked, another one, uh, Senate Bill 783 through here in the state of Michigan. This bill was uh, set up, or is set up, to allow landowners to uh, prohibit qualified patients and caregivers from utilizing their marijuana in their rented properties. So uh, kind of an interesting debate here. Part of the, uh, the issue is, is if you have a landlord, you know, he's renting a home out and he says he does not want the renters to be able to utilize medical marijuana, being that they're licensed um, currently right now that you would think that they would have that right to be able to do that. I mean, landlords can prevent things like pets or smoking in the home, but uh, this would single out people with medical marijuana. And, uh, you know, this was one of the debates that was brought up when the bill first passed back in 2008. And uh, the response was, well, you know, landlords have the ability to control their property in a manner they seem fit. Uh, and this is according to the landlord and tenants law here in Michigan. However, the, uh, one of the boards of the policies there 
was coming back and saying, well, that's not exactly the case. And we feel that if we were to prevent someone from utilizing their medical marijuana license, that they could be liable for a lawsuit as far as for discrimination. So this issue has been brought back around. And now uh, in order to uh, sort of squash the fears of the landlords and, and tenant holders, the, uh, the Senate come up with this bill. This is introduced by Senator Jones and uh, put through committee by Senator Richardsville, Senate Bill 783. And then again, this would prevent or prohibit uh, people from being able to use medical marijuana if their landlord states that they don't want them to do so. So, uh, you know, I guess it's kind of a... The only reason why I could see that a possibility, because my family had a lot of houses, mm -hmm. and um, the only reason why is because of the current statute, uh, statutes on the uh, federal level about, you know, asset forfeiture. And if, they, yes. if you don't try to stop something going on in your place, you're considered tacit approval of it. It's not the tenant that's going to lose a building. It's you who owns the building. So I can understand why th that might be a concern. I think there's yeah. really three concerns here. And, John, you're hitting on one of them, and that is, you know, okay, well, if the landlord allows the tenant to utilize their medical marijuana, that they could somehow, uh, you know, if the feds are to come in and bust that tenant, that they could potentially lose yeah. their property because they allowed this illegal activity to happen there. You know, I don't think that's a real concern for most landlord-tenant holders because, you know, in the majority, we're talking about patients here. And, you know, the federal government has really not uh, dealt with them a whole lot. They're, you know, they've relaxed their policy and stating that people that are following state law should be left alone. So I don't think that's a big issue. I think the, it, but it is one of those ones that you could bring up and say, oh, well, this is a reason for landlords to have concern. Um, one of the other issues, though, I think that is a little bit more important is, you know, the, the simple effect of smoking. You know, as a landlord, you may not want someone smoking in your home due to, you know, the smells of it. Maybe it would affect the neighbors. It could potentially uh, create the property, um, you know, sort of becoming like a, a crime hazard. You know, someone might smell marijuana and say, oh, we're going to go in and rob that place because we know they've got weed there. I guess that's one of the fears that you could say uh, could potentially rise up. The other one would be a fire hazard, of course. Um, so that's something that a landlord would have to take into consideration. Uh, and then finally, the, the last one would be is if a patient decided to grow in their home. You know, what type of modifications would they make to the home? Are they going to, you know, be tearing down walls? Or is there going to be issues with the electricity being involved, uh, fire potential, and so on and so forth? So those are all different and I think valid concerns that landlords could have. Um, again, I think it's up to the landlord already. You know, they, they could come in and say, well, you know, you cannot alter the property, you know, you're not going to be able to, you know, install a garden inside of the home. You know, that's something that a landlord could already currently do. And I don't think that's going to be a discriminatory type of uh, situation. You're not stopping someone from using their medication. Uh, you're not infringing on their rights in that type of a fashion. So I don't see how that could really be a, a potential problem. Um, one of the issues I see with this law here, though, is that Senate Bill 783, you know, you're prohibiting someone from being able to utilize their medication. And, you know, if you wanted to do that as a landlord because it's a smoked, because that person was going to smoke it, I guess in that regard, I can understand that. But there's other ways to utilize this medication. And I think that patients who are in those situations, you know, if you're in public housing or something like that where smoking is not permitted, you know, you should still be able to utilize your medication, you know, albeit that you're not smoking it, maybe you're ingesting it or using it in some other fashion. But um, you know, I think that tenants should have that right. You know, especially if they're in a desperate need and they have to have this medication. Of course, they're being prescribed or recommended uh, by their physician to utilize it. So uh, they certainly do have a need for it. And that's something that I think we have to take uh, under the advisement and, and look at more carefully. I, I don't think that uh, landlords should be able to out and out control uh, what their tenants are doing to that degree. And, and like I said, I think for the preservation of their, their property and for their rights, I could certainly understand those concerns. But to actually infringe on what that person's doing, especially to in accordance with their physician, I think it's just too far. Well, I just could say maybe have a very, very candid uh, conversation with potential, you know, uh, renters or leases and say, if you're a medical marijuana user, we would greatly encourage the use of vaporizers rather over the open smoke and regular smoking of it because if you know let's face it when you have a house that actually you have smokers in it 
when you when they move out, you have more costs connected to it because you got to repaint everything. You got to there's a lot of stuff. Absolutely, you go on. Yeah. absolutely, and I understand that. And I guess that's why I'm trying to say is that you know I, I think that as a landowner, you could pr- prohibit someone from smoking in that property. You know, you could assess a fine to it, just like a hotel does when you stay there. But um, you know, to actually go the next step and say, well, you can't use this product at all. You know, being that you're legally able to use it, and I'm going to tell you that you can't. That to me is too far. And I think that someone should still be able to utilize their medical marijuana uh, in other ways that aren't going to damage the property or leave a, a stain or so, you know, so to speak, on the property. Um, but at any rate, you know, hey, this bill's out there. It's already been fast-tracked. Senator, like I said, Senator Richardsville already passed it through committee yesterday. And uh, he's the same senator who's sitting on the other two bills that were passed by the House already. Uh, but he seems to have no problem moving this type of bill through and and sitting on the other ones. So, uh, you know, it doesn't really surprise me there. But at any rate, you know, I think this is something that is unnecessary and uh, something that patients should be aware of. Now, it doesn't say that landlords have to prohibit. It just says that they can. Um, And like I said, I think they already have full the amount of, uh, I guess, the amount of protection that they need, I think, is already existent in the law uh, to, to say that, you know, well, this is a, a fear of being sued in a discrimination case. I don't, I don't know. I think that's a little far-fetched. But uh, at any rate, this bill's moving through the Senate, and uh, there's no complimentary bill to it in the House yet, uh, but it could use your uh, sentiment, could use your comments, So if you feel like it, please take time and contact your senator uh, here from Genesee County and let them know how you feel. That's kind of, uh, it needs needs to be heard how people think about this. Uh, All right, let's see what else we got here. I know I had something else here. Oh yeah, here we go. This is the banking issue. This was uh, something that went through last Friday, Friday of last week. And uh, they're saying that new guidelines are outlined in a joint statement by the Justice Department allowing financial institutions to deal with or offer services to marijuana-related businesses uh, as long as the businesses are in compliance with state and federal enforcement priorities. Now, I think that's kind of an oxymoron statement right there. How could you be in compliance with federal enforcement priorities, being that you're federally illegal? I don't know. But at any rate, this statement came out and it basically is saying that, you know, hey, if your marijuana business is legal under state law and you want to open a bank account, that uh, your banking institution now has the ability or the go ahead from the federal government to do so. Now, um, there's a little bit of controversy going along with this because some of the banking officials are stepping up and saying, well, not so fast. We don't exactly feel safe with that type of. uh, general statement we'd like something a little bit more specific it's going to provide us a little bit further protection should we start dealing with this uh with these funds and um you know i I think that they've got a point this is a comment here frank keating chief excuse me chief executive officer of the american bankers association acknowledged the effort but implied the new rules are unlikely to change much he says as it stands possession distribution Uh, of marijuana violates federal law and that banks that provide support for those activities face the risk of prosecution and assorted sanctions. Um, Basically, they think the only way to this, you know, change this is to have Congress change the law. And I think that they've got a good point there. Because what they're going to do is they're going to go after people with the big pocket, deep pockets. If they bust somebody for something and then they can trump up charges, they're not going to go after the low-level person. They're going to go after the bankers because they got the deep pockets. Well, you know, it, they may or they may not. I think that, you know, as a, as a banker and you're, you're taking on people's deposits and so forth, that, uh, you know, just to have those deposits seized out of your operating uh, operations, that could be a big blow to banking business in itself, uh, let alone having being sanctioned or having some type of uh, criminal charges filed against the bank. Uh, those are even a di- on top of that. But, um, you know, and the, the Colorado Bankers Association says that they're hesitant to take advantage of this situation. They say that we don't see that the guidance is giving banks a full green light to these bank, uh, bank these businesses. And um, so they're looking for more information. I, I think it's interesting that the Justice Department 
and Treasury actually said something about this. It actually came out in a formal statement and, and uh, brought the subject, you know, to their lips. It's certainly a subject that's been in the light for quite some time. You know, uh, being a cash-operated business in medical marijuana or in these states here like Colorado and Washington where it's recreational ex uh, as well, uh, certainly can pose a lot of risk, criminal risk to those businesses. But, um, you know, the banks aren't willing to take on the additional risk that's associated with that. And they're not going to until they have a, a set policy, something that's law that they can depend on. Um, most banks are doing pretty well right now. They don't really need the extra business, so to speak. I'm sure they'd like to have it, but they're not willing to take it on uh, if it comes along with that added risk. And I, I think that banks are smart to continue in this fashion until they have something more concrete. There's been a number of different businesses that have been raided uh, that were operating, you know, so to speak, uh, legally in their state as medical marijuana businesses. And so if that were to occur, then the accounts or the assets that belong to those businesses would viably be seized and uh, the bank is going to be affected by that, no question. So it looks like the, the statement, you know, it's, I think it's a step forward. It's, it's a step in the right direction. But uh, they're definitely going to have to have something more concrete before the bankers actually feel up to handling that type of business. So, and we'll you see. Know, this might actually help out the average person, though, who wants to engage in this kind of business. Because now, if the big boys can get the Congress and senators to pass stuff to, you know, basically ensure their, you know, their safety, then it's going to have basically have an impact on the net positive side for those who want to start these kind of businesses. But it's going to take a few years down, a few years down the road, I think. I think yeah. so. I mean, you're starting to see uh, investors. I mean, like there's numerous different marijuana stocks that are available now. Um, so there's there's other types of financials going on in the industry. There's no question about that. But you know, in order for the the uh, the industry to really have that great leap forward, you know, they are going to need to have banking institutions. Uh, be allowed or, or feel comfortable in dealing with them in their in their matters. So I, I think it's a step in the right direction, but we're going to have to have something a little bit more concrete, apparently, before banks jump in. Um, so we'll see. Let's see here. Ah. Uh. Apologize. Give me just a minute. Okay, this is out of uh, Washington State. I thought this was kind of interesting. Obviously, Washington State being one of the states that just legalized marijuana last year for recreational purposes. Uh, it seems on the back end now, the medical marijuana patients are sort of getting uh, the short end of the stick, if you will. Uh, the Senate in Washington State approved a bill to amend the Medical Marijuana Act they have and basically just do away with it. Um, they're saying, well, it's available now on a recreational level. So people who are using it for medicinal purposes don't need to have the uh, additional protections provided to them and should just be able to go get it on the, uh, the recreational market, if you will. Now, the problem is, is that for patients out there, this presents a conundrum. It, it, uh, it does a number of things. First of all, uh, legal Marijuana for recreational purposes has an additional tax associated with it. So number one, the prices for those patients' medicinal products are going to go up right away because of the tax. Uh, the other things that it does impede on for the patient is their ability to uh, have marijuana. It limits the amount down, uh, I think, from what the state's previous level was for medical marijuana patients. It limits it down to the recreational level, if you will, which is a significant difference, not only in the amount that they're allowed to possess on their person, but also in the amount that they're allowed to grow for themselves. So kind of a, a bad thing there. Um, patients are upset about this, and it looks like they're trying to do something about it. This is, again, a bill that's moving through the, uh, through the House out there in Washington State. And uh, let's see if I can get you some numbers on here. It says, uh, currently right now, patients are allowed to have up to 15 plants. Uh, that would drop their number down to six plants instead. And instead of being allowed to have 24 ounces, it would drop their limit down to three. So uh, at any rate, that's what they're looking at. I think it's kind of interesting that they're going back and redoing these laws. It seems like, well, they already have them. They should probably just leave them alone. But uh, at any rate, it's like there's somebody who has their interest on changing this law. 
and uh, it doesn't seem to be in the patient's favor. So there's still time for them to uh, change that, but at any rate, that's where things are at in the state of Washington. So I don't know. Uh, do you ever think they'd have blowback on that and get a state that's legalized and now the, the patients are kind of getting screwed? I don't know. Interesting. All right, our neighbors to the west of us, a little farther down the line, Minnesota. Looks like uh, their interest in medical marijuana is not so hot. Looks like they had uh, some questions pop up about that. We've been talking about it in the legislature there, but they're uh, not anytime soon. It doesn't seem like they're going to have medical marijuana. And it seems like they're not getting any headway in it. There was a, a legislator, state rep, Carly Mellon. Uh, she had researched a story about the upcoming legislation. or Excuse me. She was being researched about upcoming legislation. And she said that there's no provisions in the bill that they are willing to support and that they're not willing to work with them at all. So looks like the uh, legislature out there in Minnesota is not so hot. Uh, another state that I thought was kind of interesting is Wisconsin. Um, looks like their governor is clearly anti-pot out there, uh, wants nothing to do with it, and uh, actually went on CNN recently and said that uh, Obama's wrong. Medical marijuana, or marijuana in general, is quite a bit more dangerous than alcohol and feels that uh, it's a far cry between having a couple beers and smoking a joint. So, I don't know. Doesn't look too good over there in Wisconsin thought maybe that might be one of those next states to uh, bring medical marijuana to the forefront, but it uh, appears that their governor is not a positive force in that at all. Um, meanwhile, looks like Florida is moving right along. They got their ballot measure up and going, and now they're trying to drive support for their November elections. Even had a Republican in the Florida Senate admit that he had once bought cannabis uh, for a dying friend. So, you know, when you have people coming out in the Senate... Uh, talking about this being used as a medicinal purpose, talking about having personal uh, experiences with it. I mean, I think that's a good thing. It, it lets people uh, who may be hesitant about it sort of warm up to the issue, if you will. So kind of good stuff there. Uh, all right, and one other state here, Iowa. Looks like their medical marijuana bill is going nowhere. I'm reading to you from tokeofthetown.com. Uh, apparently the issue is just a little too hot, and it's a politician's year got a lot of votes going on out there in Iowa, and apparently marijuana is just too hot of an issue for them to deal with uh, during an election year. So stay out of Iowa, I guess. <laughs> too bad. All right, uh, I got a couple things I wanted to share with you. There's a couple charity events going on here. Uh, we've got a couple flyers we wanted to show to you. One is coming up here on, I'm not sure which one you're going to show first, John, the, the one on the 8th or the 28th. The eighth one. All right. This is uh, the Literacy Coalition. They're doing a benefit dinner at Luigi's. Uh, Luigi's is the pizza joint here in town. It's on, again, March 8th. And uh, this is for the Literacy Coalition. The event's 10 bucks for adults, seven fifty for kids. And it's from 12 to 4 on March 8th. This is obviously to help adults and children learn how to read. It's a charity event. Again, going out at Luigi's. You can go down there and get yourself some pizza. Feed the family and uh, help support the Literacy Coalition. It's a pretty cool event. Check that out if you can. Again, that's at Luigi's on March 8th. Uh, next event we got coming up here. This is uh, March 28th. This will be a fun event here. Uh, we're going back to bowling. This is at the Bees Bowling Center on Center Road here in Flint. Or is that actually Burton, I think? Actually, I think it's in Flint on the side of it because you go across the street, you're in Burton. Okay, yeah, so, so it's right on the border there. But Bees Bowling Center... Uh, the event is on March 28th. This is for Building Strong Women. Uh, the group's called Building Strong Women. This is for helping women overcome uh, domestic abuse and also drug abuse. The event is $20, and that's uh, it'll be a fun bowling time and go to support a great organization, like I said, Building Strong Women. Again, that's March 28th at Bees Bowling Center. So go on down there. Do you have a time on that, John? I missed out on that. No, I guess there isn't. I guess so. It's like a, they didn't have one on that flyer. So okay, maybe yeah. like an all-day event or something. Pretty like much, that. yeah. That's where I'm. That's where I'm gathering. Yeah. Okay, but uh, yeah, anyways, a great organization. Definitely goes for an excellent cause there. So join them down at Bees Bowling Center on March 28th if you can. That's a Friday, and I'm sure that'll be lots of fun. And uh, we'd left definitely like to see you guys down there. Um, that's about it for news and information I have for you this week. It's too beautiful to be inside, so we got to get back out there. 
I appreciate you guys joining me and listening to all the fun facts you have about marijuana. If you guys would like to share something on the show or if you have a question, you can always call in at our number. It's 810-208-1854. John, thanks for being with me in the studio today. I definitely appreciate your commentary as always. And uh, thanks again, FlintTalkRadio.com. This is the Genesee County Compassion Club Show. Thanks, guys. Have a good week.